Hey, welcome back to D20 Play. Let's take a look at the MCDM Playtest Packet 1 uh, rules. I'm coming at this from a D&D background, Pathfinder background, um, 20, D D20 system background. So I'm kind of trying to highlight some of the things I might change from that. What is this game? This game is about fighting monsters, about larger than life, extraordinary heroes plunging into battle against terrifying monstrous enemies. They make some mention of Shadow Dark, a great game. Forbidden Lands, Call of Cthulhu, Paranoia. They have some keywords, tactical, heroic, cinematic, and fantasy. So let's dig into those just uh, real quick a little bit. So tactical, you're going to want to be playing on a grid. You're going to have a view of what's going on in the combat. Your positioning matters. Now, one little caveat I'm worried about here is the idea that uh, teamwork is going to be discussed at every play. Games really can bog down when you have like group um, group discussions of best strategy on every person's turn. So it's going to be really on the director to push that forward, push through that. A little bit of that, that's okay, but too much, not so good. So watch out for that, I think. Heroic, this is cool. What's happening on screen is what matters. You don't have to spend a couple hours role-playing, buying ammo down at the corner store. Just get to the action. Don't worry about how much everything you're carrying weighs. Don't track food. Don't track rations. Don't track torches. Uh, only worry about what things you'd see your character doing in a movie or a comic or a novel. I think that's pretty cool. I think this is a pretty good idea, pretty good slant. Cinematic, it's going to be like what's happening in a movie, what's happening in a novel. Fantasy, it's mostly dragons and stuff. Now, there's a little bit of mention of space fantasy built in here. We have uh, the Timescape, their multiverse. Timescape is more explicitly, quote, space fantasy. The rule, the core rules mostly cover the classic fantasy stuff, but we think that they'll be able to deliver on uh, probably more steampunky, more spacey, things like that. So that's a neat overall slant on the game world. So that is what MCDM RPG is in a nutshell, broad outlines at the start. So now let's dig into the rules here. We have the basics. So it's the standard give and take of a DM and players. DM describing the world, players telling the DM how, he's intera how they're interacting, and then the DM telling them the results. And there is a little caveat here. Uh, attempting a task without a risk of failure shouldn't be a role. Just it's going to narratively succeed. Only role if there's going to be some interesting result or if there's some time pressure on it. That's mentioned a couple of times in these rules. When combat begins, use a square gridded map so you know where everyone's at. Position matters. Dice. Interestingly, there are only D4s, D6s, and D8s right now in the game. The D6 is the core die. D4s can also be used as a regular die or as boon dice or as bane dice. And these can stack on each other. They offset one for one. So you're going to, in the end, only have a certain number of boon or a certain number of bane, but they can stack, unlike 5th edition, where advantage and disadvantage, no matter how many times you have it, does not stack. Impact dice, D8s, uh, one of the die that can be basically added on to things as you get higher level, especially. Scores. So um, what you might think of as ability scores, strength, dex, con, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, is are called characteristics in this game. And you're only seeing the modifier. If you're used to a 3 to 18 range, you're going to see a modifier. Generally in the minus 3 to plus 3 range, minus 4 to plus 4 range. Uh, but it can go as much as minus 5 to plus 10. An average human, of course, has zeros across the board. They gave all the names a slightly different name. I'm not sure if this is a great idea. If people are coming from D&D, they would know what these are if they called them what D&D calls them. I don't know if there's a copyright issue there or not, but they are Might, Agility, and Endurance instead of Strength, Dex, and Con. And then for the intelligent or the uh, mental characteristics, they are, instead of Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma, they're Reason, Intuition, and Presence. Game is a game of exceptions, so the exception overrides the general rule. You always round down, define creatures, define objects, define NPCs, define PCs. They talk about the heroic narrative, and there are some important uh, quantities here. You got your victories. You gain a victory basically after every combat or after every major non-combat challenge. You reset victories when you rest, and those turn into experience. Right now, it appears you need 10 experience to gain a level. That might only be first level. We haven't seen the higher level stuff, so I don't know if that'll hold true at higher levels. You have your heroic resources, which on the, uh, the pre-generated characters include things like insight and rage and virtue and wrath and strain and focus and i'm sure there'll be others you don't gain victories by killing bags of rats by killing commoners uh just heroic things count you can spend recoveries these are like healing surges in fourth edition you'd also get regular healing as well on top of this that might also spend surges or do it without i mean spend recoveries or do it without spending recoveries recoveries regain about one third of your health so and the characters, the pre-gen characters, have recoveries that are in the range from anywhere from 8 to 12. So 
if you had nine, you could recover all your health three times. So pretty strong. A lot of uh, ability to recover in game. When you rest, and this is like a long, long rest, you're in safe safety, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're dressing your wounds, you're recuperating. You convert all your victories to experience and you begin all your health and all your recoveries. Okay, we have the core mechanic of tests. So to make a test, this would be like an ability check or a saving throw in fifth edition. You roll 2d6 and add your appropriate characteristic score. You have target numbers. When do you roll? Only when it matters. What types of rolls do different characteristics cover? Generally what you're used to, and they have that defined here. Um, failed tests should always result in the story becoming more interesting, not in the action coming to an end. So if, you, if the story is behind a secret door, as a one in six chance being found, that's terrible. That's a five in six chance your adventure ends there. There should be some other way around it that the party can find to, can get to. And if a player describes something really cool, you can just say it works. Uh, that's a cool little sidebar there. Not really sidebar, but rule there. Okay, target numbers. This is like difficulty check or difficulty classes in fifth edition. You can share it with the players. Sir of Victory recommends this in some instances where the players know what they're rolling, what the stakes are with what they're rolling. That makes that roll more dramatic. You can also hide it from them if you want to retain some attention that way. Typical target numbers. So an easy task is a seven, moderate's a nine, hard is a 12. So I made up a little uh, table here of probabilities. So this is the probability of getting this number or greater. And we have seven in green here is easy nine as moderate in yellow and 12 as hard in red. Now, if you're rolling straight 2d6, you're a human, you got no characteristic modifier. Your chances for easy, moderate, and hard are 58% of the time, 28% of the time, and 3% of the time. So I don't know if that's really very easy for a regular human, but when you add a characteristic that you're good at, like a equivalent of a 16 or a 17 in D&D, you got a plus three modifier. Your chance for easy goes up to 92%. Your chance for moderate goes up to 72%, hard goes up to 28%. So probably appropriate names for a hero in the typical target ranges. Uh, if you had like a single boon, here's what the modifiers would be. If you had a single boon plus you had a good ability score in it, you had 99% on easy and even 64% on hard. So really on a bell curve, uh, modifiers can have a much bigger effect than they do on a flat curve. So if you're in a D20 system where every change of a number is a 5% change, on a bell curve, it's becoming much bigger changes as you hit the ends of the bell curve. Can you do tests during combat? Yeah, uh, they're made as maneuvers normally. There are degrees of success. Generally, if you got four or higher than what you need, it's gonna have some other beneficial effect. The costly failure is not defined here. There's an example later where it's a three. We're used to fifth edition, if you like fail the climb check by five or more, you fall, do that kind of a thing. Can I try again? Generally, only if the circumstances of the test change would you be able to try again. That's kind of standard. Opposed tests, they got a little bit of wording nuance here. I think their intent is that a tie makes no change to the state, which is what 5th edition does. But the wording here says, if your success compared to the result of the creature and a success is equal to or greater, then you uh, win. So I, these two can't coexist. I think the second one's the intent. Uh, applying skills, if you have a skill that applies to a test, you add a boon, basically, at first to fifth level. At sixth and higher level, you had to add an impact die. I don't know if I'd do that. I think I'd go to two boons at six or higher level because then you retain the boon and bane offsetting each other. And, you know, a D8 versus 2D4 is about the same range. So I might tweak that. Uh, skills don't go with characteristics. Just like a fifth edition, they don't have to go with characteristics. There's always a default listed. And there's many default examples in here. But uh, might athletics, for example, but you could have other ways you could put things together. And if you have a... a skill that can go with any characteristic they might just list the skill and then you just apply the characteristic that you think could go with it and you can do it if you, you can do a check even if you don't have a skill just rolling against the characteristic if unless the director deems otherwise okay missing characteristic and skills uh director has final say and then they go into the skills so they have acrobatics used to that athletics this has got a straight oh with acrobatics we have move through enemies target number of nine so if you're a good acrobatic, a target number nine is going to be 72% of the time. If you're untrained, it's 28%. Or if you're not good at, at that, 28% of the time. If you don't have a good characteristic and you're trained, 64, good characteristic, uh, and trained, 93. So there's your chances of tumbling through. Looks like it doesn't limit it on who can. Looks like anyone can in theory. Uh, you fall prone if you fail, so it can be dangerous. It doesn't say your move ends, and standing up takes two movements. So if the intent is that move would end, should, that should be added here. You can safely land from a fall. Athletics, um, 
okay, so athletics has been split. Athletics you do that is like climbing, jumping, and swimming is this. And then athletics you do opposed by something like to bend bars, to bash open a door, that is called vigor in the system. I'm not sure they need to be separated. It seems like they could be the same skill and reduce the number of skills by one. Climbing um, and swimming, basically, are using athletics. Charm is like persuasion. You can impress, you can persuade. Craft is like the tool proficiencies in 5e, but here they are skills. And there's kind of like no limit to them. You can divide them into whatever groups of crafts that you want. You can create things. Uh, there's a chance of failure. And here's an example where you fail by three or more, a bad result happens. They have a deceive. They have empathy, which is like intuition. They have intimidate. They have knowledge. Now here, I think they have too many different areas. I liked where fifth edition bolted down to like four or five different areas. Um, here they get kind of pretty detailed. And there's like, 12 examples here, 11 examples here. You can recall lore. Uh, notice is like perception and also like investigation mixed into one, suggesting using intuition, notice, or reason, notice to search. Skullduggery, that's like uh, um, sleight of hand. You can conceal, pick locks, uh, steal. If you don't have lockpicks, you can make improvised lockpicks, but you suffer one bane. If you're trying to steal out of a container, uh, you can do it but with one bane. Target number is basically against, it's a pose check against their intuition notice check. Hide, um, stealth opposed by notice. You need to be obscured, all kind of standard stuff for hiding. You can sneak if you're moving at uh, faster than half your speed, you got a bane. Here's Vigor, the other half of athletics. Bend or break bars, uh, lift objects, and everything's got a weight here. Like characters mostly have a weight of four, and they have a table later that shows the different weights. Not here on this page, but later on in the in the packet they have a table with weights adventuring uh kind of sparse here but supernatural and mundane are defined adjacents defined resistance rules are 2d6 and your characteristic i don't know if any classes get any bonuses like saving throw bonuses are in fifth edition haven't seen that yet suffocating defined adventuring gear basically if you have a skill you have the gear for the skill you can assume you have it you can assume you have basic adventuring gear like a torture rope and a backpack torches light 10 squares you can assume you have torches you don't need a track there durations Rope is 10 squares, 50 feet long. Should make climbing automatic, unless the director deems otherwise. Okay, then we come into abilities. These aren't your ability scores like fifth edition, but these are like your powers, your class features, things like that. And you have how long they take. It can be an action, a maneuver, triggered action, free maneuver, free triggered action. We get to all those in combat. Melee requires you be within touch, reach of a creature, area of effect. They... I like the air effect. This is like a lot of fourth edition type wording in the air of effect, which made adjudication at a table very easy. Yeah, you lost a little verisimilitude where your fireball was a cube instead of a ball, but it was worth it, I thought. And I like that they're going this route here. Uh, they get some definition of where you can put it. Um, you don't have to have range to the whole air effect, but at least range to one of the squares of it. And you don't have to see the whole air effect, but you have to see one of the squares of it. Your bursts are centered on you. Your cubes are a cube of X length in all directions. Your lines are defined, etc. Self is on you only. You have targets that can be creature, object, enemy, ally, hero, or all. Generally, you decide who the enemy or the ally is as a, as a player. Damage types. You're generally... Uh, okay, so big feature here in MCDM. You don't roll to hit. There's no two hit roll. Now, you lose a little bit of gaminess with that, like things like shield spell or, um, or parry or cutting words from a bard. And so those some of those things are rolled into the damage side. And of course, your dex doesn't help you, but in theory, that might give you more health in your dex, or you have kits that can help define things. Kits can give you more health as well. We'll look at that. We're going to take a look at the characters on a live show here in a couple days, and we'll look in some detail on how the kits affect the characters. Okay, so you have the effect. Now, the effect will come with some damage. It might, I mean, the effect comes after damage, and it can be resistible. If the resistance rule succeeds, the effect doesn't affect the target. There, I haven't seen any that have been, you know, resist for half, just resist. If it allows an ability, if the ability allowing a resist rule does no damage, typically they automatically succeed on the effect. You can spend resources. You have alternative effects you can choose from. Effects generally, if they're the same, don't stack. You take the longer duration and use it. Effects end at the end of a combat. Some effects end when you make a resistance rule that you can repeat. Line of effect is defined, generally standard line of effect rules. Blighted is half your health. No effect on its own, but other powers might rely on it. Uh, other conditions are dazed and frightened and grappled. 
interesting thing on grappled is um, a forced move does not break a grapple like it does in 5e. Either the creature you're grappling moves with you or you move the creature you're grappling. Now you can drop a grapple in time so you don't have to like follow a creature you're grappling off a cliff. You can just let go of them and let them go. Ongoing damage. Interestingly, this can have multiple instances of this. So if you have ongoing five fire from two different sources, I think you take 10 fire at the start of a round. Now the way initiative works, um, your position of your turn in a round can move around. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, you take damage at the start of a round. So that makes it so where you go, your turn is, doesn't matter as much. Prone condition, restraint conditions, load, kind of all the standard effects you'd expect from all these conditions. Unbalanced. Here's a new one. Uh, your health is zero or lower. You can't take the recover action in combat. You make a test using a physical characteristic, which is might, uh, agility, and endurance. You are going to take five damage. You make an attack, you're going to take five damage. Use an action or a triggered action, you take five damage. And you don't you die when you get to minus your bloodied value. I really like that, that the heroes can keep going until they're dead. They should get out. They should you know save themselves, but they can keep, and at least they get to play themselves, saving themselves and getting out. Unconscious as you'd expect. Um, attacks made against you gain three boons. So it's not like they hit automatically, but they just do three d four more damage. Um, weekend while you're weekend, your attacks suffer two banes. So that is that for the ability section. Here's the combat section. Okay, so. Use a map. Uh, each square is five feet, two meters if you prefer metric. Size and space. Creatures can have different sizes and spaces. This was from, I think, third edition did this. I think 3.5 or 4 went to the square um, fighting area. Kind of like the square fighting area better. I don't know if I'd want to regress to two by one for a horse, for example. But there you go. I think they got a little typo here. Two creatures can't occupy the same square. Period is where they could stop it. Or they could have said one creature can't occupy the same square as another creature on the map. But they did the two different things. So I don't think the intent is that you can have three creatures, just two. Here's the weight table I spoke of. So a human's four, a dragon's nine, a keep is 10, 11 plus too heavy to lift, I guess, a castle. Um, in combat, there are sides. There's always two sides. The side's controlled by the players and the side's controlled by the director. And even if the director has multiple antagonists who are against each other, as long as they're also against the players, he controls them all as one side. Combat consists of rounds, Every creature gets a turn in the round. The director determines surprise, determine initiative. Um, I think this could be simplified. One player rolls a d6, director rolls a d6, it's a tie, you re-roll. Whoever gets the highest has initiative. Just make it a d6 roll, the players roll, and if they roll high, four, five, or six, they win. One die roll, and it resolves it, and they're in control. And everyone's going to be watching that die roll. Uh, creatures take turns, so whichever side wins goes first. Chooses a creature. Um, to act as the start of combat. Interesting. It doesn't say a creature on their side. I think that's the intent. You don't get to pick someone on the other side to act first. Uh, track which creatures have already acted. Determine who acts next. So here's some leeriness I have here of, you know, devolving into an argument about strategy with every turn and everyone playing everyone else's character. I don't like that. I like people to get immersed in their character, know their action, act quick, make the combat cinematic and fast and pulse pounding. Uh, so... We'll be watching this, see how this plays out. Uh, the choice of who acts next is up to the whole party. And But if there's an argument, the DM should put a 30-minute timer and then pick if they don't pick. Or they have alternative initiative, which is more like what we're used to with 5th edition. Uh, does have the caveat to swap spots, or you could have the caveat to maybe um, delay like that in 4th edition. Taking a turn. Okay, on your turn, you get to do a maneuver and an action. I like that mechanic. Just one maneuver, one action, any order. You can swap out your action for a second maneuver. You'll see you can do some things with maneuvers that are more extensive than just move here in a second. Uh, triggered actions and free triggered actions. One triggered action per round. Free triggered, as many as you want, um, as long as the director agrees. Um, if there's multiple happening at the same time, the heroes go first, then the director controlled monsters go. Free maneuvers, in theory, as many as you want. Um, things like opening a door, picking an arrow from the ground, giving an object to an ally, drawing a weapon. Don't need to track those. No action activities. This would be on not your turn. So when it isn't your turn, you can yell to someone, you can drop an item, etc. Within discretion of the director. Always movement. All squares adjacent are one movement. So no counting one and then one and a half for diagonals. Uh, they're just always one or one and a half for all diagonals. Uh, lose a little bit of verisimilitude, but I think it's way worth it. Also easy to count range this way. You just count in an orthogonal range and you got it. You can move sp through spaces occupied by your allies. No penalty there, it looks like. And you can't move through your enemy spaces without making a might acrobatics or tumble check, basically. You can't move through a prone enemy space. Can't exceed your speed. Shifting is like the equivalent of disengage. 
If you move at half your speed, you don't provoke what are called chance hits. Now, chance hits don't do a lot of damage. Like, uh, for example, the the uh, the pre-generated character chance hits are like on the order of D4 plus five damage. Not a lot. Uh, movement types got all the different regular movement types. Burrow clarifies only through dirt. Climb or swim costs two squares per square. You make a check if there's um, something very difficult about it. You can't climb or swim if you fail, but you waste no movement. I would I would not say you waste no movement. I'd say you lose that move because uh, you tried. You just didn't make progress. And what if you fail by a certain amount? Do you chance falling? Climbing other creatures. This is fun. Uh, if a creature's unwilling, you can make a might athletics test opposed by their might or agility test. Climb them. And if you attack them, you gain a boon on the attack. Uh, they can use a maneuver to try and throw you off. Yeah. So that's cool. That's that's fun. Jumping. Um, need some clarification here. The long jump, a number of squares up to your might score. So is that the squares you clear or how many squares you move and you clear what's in between? Uh, and then if you move at least two, you add two to that. So let's say a commoner. Um, can't jump any with a standing, but can jump uh, two. Do they clear two or do they land in the second and they clear one? Need some clarification there. You can make a check to make it further. Height is too much. Um, clearing a square, clearing two squares. I mean, clearing 10 feet off the ground is ridiculous maybe that might be the extreme you could do it but to add more squares up to your might score just way overboard <laughs> you're jumping like 20 feet a human clearing 20 feet um off the ground is ridiculous michael jordan came and clear 10 feet off the ground and he's probably got the highest might score you could have with regard to jumping if you want to jump both higher and longer than your usual jump you can check uh crawling one extra square move for crawling standard flying if you're knocked prone or speed reduces zero you fall standard teleporting doesn't provoke uh destination space can't be occupied by another it needs to be vacant uh doesn't spend your movement you stay prone if you were the one teleporting you can stand up if someone else teleported you you stay prone and you are breaking grapple or restrained when you teleport i think this is an error here the creature teleporting you must have line of effect from the space you leave to your destination space i imagine they mean from line of effect to your current space and to your destination space like they have to see both um do you i mean if you're bypassing obstacles do you have to see the destination space do you have to have line of effect i don't know i think that those two bullets need to be clarified a little bit difficult train standard one extra movement force movement this is from fourth edition standard push directly away pull directly towards slide any direction and then they added toss where you can go up into the air that's cool in order difficult train never provokes uh slamming into creatures these are cool rules here Lighter creature takes additional damage equal to the distance in both creatures, difference in both creatures' weights. I don't think this plays correctly. I should change that to red. That definitely did, I think. Because you can slam someone into a steel wall, and they're only going to take damage equal to how much movement they have left. And a steel wall is definitely harder than slamming into an ogre. So I would get, I would probably remove that completely there. Then you slam into objects, and this is a really cool way to do it. I like this a lot. You can basically break through an object. You're going to take the damage, you can break the object, then you could, could keep going depending on how much you're being forced to move. I like that. That's really cool. If you're forced into a fall, like they push you off a cliff, you keep going the, the full force move, and then you start to fall. Falling, not a lot of damage for falling like 10 feet, 20 feet. I mean, heck, you fall 20 feet. That's what, four squares? You take four damage? Not a, hardly anything. Uh, so that might need to be updated, made more dangerous, I would think, because you're not take, you can fall 40 feet and take eight damage. And if you look at the health of these characters, they can all take multiples of eight damage. Uh, falling far, you fall 100 feet when you first start to fall, and at the end of each subsequent round, another 100 feet. That's cool. Oh, no, 100 squares, so 500 feet. What is terminal velocity? I think it's pretty high. I think it's like 1,600 feet. Uh, so, but, I mean, this works. It's a fantasy game. Maneuvers. Okay, so here's maneuver. So on your turn, you get to do a maneuver, and you get to do an action. Maneuver. Uh, whenever a maneuver allows a creature to move, they can spend some of their movement, use an action, and spend the rest. So you can... Split up your movement. Here's where that rule sitting in the in this playtest. Then you have moving and uh, assisting. Now assisting is only going to give one boon. That's, it's not a lot. Um, it might be a lot on making a check, but it's not a lot on damage done. So assisting an attack isn't that great compared to assisting a check. Uh, break a grapple. And when you break a grapple, you can shift one. If you're grappled by a big creature, it's going to get really hard. You're going to get multiple banes or boons depending on size differences. And multiple creatures get multiple... Uh, banes. Interestingly, it doesn't say that about restraint. If you're restrained by multiple creatures, I think it should be the same. Drinking of potions and maneuvers. You can drink, in theory, two potions around because you can do two maneuvers around, but you can drink a potion and attack. You can administer it to someone else also. Grappling. Uh, basically, it's the person getting grappled making a check against your might score, seven plus your might score. And size differences matter. And you only grapple one, one creature at a time if your day is prone or unconscious. 
No grapple's going to end. Hiding in combat, I think they might need more here. It doesn't say anything about you having to be uh, like obscured from people. You just have a target number, nine plus the number of enemy creatures who have line of effect to you. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if that gets more clarification. Hindering, uh, basically, they get a bane. So again, this isn't going to do a whole lot of combat damage. But it'll do probably good for checks. Knockback. So no, this is maneuver. So you can grapple as a maneuver. You can knock someone back as a maneuver, knock them prone as a maneuver. Uh, and then you can do the attack. And you'll get a boon die if they're prone. And again, like grappling, you set the target number with your might, and they have to make a might or ability resistance roll of choice. Throw an object. This is not throwing an object as an attack, but just hurling it through space. Uh, I don't think... Okay, you can you can throw something whose weight's less than your might score. The number of squares equal to your might score, so maybe three squares if you're really mighty. Um, if it's really light, you can throw it six squares. Or you can make a check and throw a number of squares of the result. That, I think, is too much. You're throwing something three squares, but you could easily get a result of 12. Throw 12 squares. Um, actions. Uh, charge. So you can charge. Move up to your speed. Straight line. Basic attack. Defending. Um, attacks against you suffer two banes. Kind of a losing proposition. Um, they're going to hit you automatically, and you're only going to take less damage by maybe four and a half damage on average. Recovery. You can use your recovery. Attacking. Any attack made against a creature within your reach is considered a melee attack. If the attack exceeds your reach, it's a ranged attack. Even with a ranged weapon, I don't know if that's the intent or not, but that's the way it's worded. Damage and attacks. An attack targets multiple creatures. You roll damage only one time. Uh, you'd apply that damage to everyone, but you'd apply the boons and banes individually as they apply to individuals in the damage. The damage comes first, then the effect. You can critical hit as long as you're rolling a 2d6 attack, and you get a crit if you roll 11 or 12. So three times out of 36 on the standard 2d6. So one time out of 10, roughly. Basic attack uh, can't be modified by heroic resources. Chance hit when a creature within your reach moves out of your reach without shifting. It's a free triggered action, so you can make as many of these as you want. It's only D4 plus your highest characteristic, uh, plus your kit's damage. Uh, you can't do it if you have a ban on your melee attacks, and you can't gain boons for it. So pretty straightforward, pretty fast. Be fast to adjudicate. Cover, pretty standard. Two banes on attacks against a creature with a cover. Can't see. Only one bane, but you have to guess where they're at. So being invisible in melee with someone who knows where you're at is not that great. It's only taking D4 off their attack damage. Not a lot. Damage types. Typical damage doesn't have a type. Um, special types of damage do have types like acid, cold, etc. Immunities will be like to a damage type and then a number. So fire immunity 5, they take 5 off every 5. Uh, magic weakness 5, they add 5 to every damage. If there's immunity with no number, then they're completely immune. Health, we talked about recoveries and the healing value. Unbalanced and death, we talked about that. Uh, when you die, your victories and resources drop to zero and you can't be healed or brought back to life without use of a special power such as scroll of resurrection. Your right to controlled creatures die at zero or the attacker can choose to knock them out. They don't have recoveries, but you can assume they have recoveries if some special power grants them a recovery use. Uh, mounted combat, not real a lot of detail here. It looks like a mount might build act on its own, you know, do a maneuver, do an attack, maybe. Uh, you can forgo your maneuver to give them one more maneuver once into combat. Um, this is cool. Into combat. So when the director determines the heroes each gain a victory, and the director can do, once the objectives are defeated or it's clear they're going to win, the director can end it. And they can end it with a dramatic finish. Heroes describe what happens to what's left. They kill it, they knock it out, they force it to flee. Or the director could end it with a ending event. So this is cool. Like if you're in an adventure and you achieve some great objective, you stop some ritual summoning of some demon lord, it kind of is anticlimactic then to go and wipe up the few remaining uh, cultists that are left. So you can just call it right there. They have also this last health thing where you could instead lower all remaining cultists down to one hit point. And next hit kills them. Uh, that would kind of give the satisfaction of wiping them up if the party cares. I kind of feel that a little anticlimactic. Negotiation. So this is a new thing they're doing. They have a lot of text here talking about it. And we get into the rules for it here. So negotiation is basically kind of a separate game. It's like, a, it's like you drop into combat, you drop into negotiation. And you have some stats that apply to negotiation. The NPCs have interest. Patience, motivation, and pitfalls. And the party's trying to get their interest as high as they can before their patience runs out. And the party's trying to play to their motivations and avoid their pitfalls. So interest, that is anywhere from one to four. They can go as high as five or as low as zero. Gets to five, uh, negotiation is over and the party got the best result. Goes to zero, the negotiation is over, the party got the worst result. Or the negotiation could end when the patience goes to zero and they're somewhere in between. Now, motivations are things the party can, you know, call toward and gain successes. 
pitfalls or things the party needs to avoid or they'll gain failures. And by failures, I mean, and successes, I mean, interest going up, patients going down, etc. So you open with the heroes asking for something. And if they're in combat, you can try and stop the combat to jump into negotiation. The target numbers there, pretty difficult. Let's say you're pretty good at charm or intimidating and you're losing the battle. You need to get a 15. Well, you only got a 3% chance. Uh, if you have a boon from something, only a 24% chance. So real low chance if you're losing the battle for them to decide to negotiate. Um, the starting stats you lay out, interest and patience and the target number. And then you can try to uncover their motivations just by asking them, hey, what do you want? They might not offer that up, in which case you can try and suss it out from them. You can also try and suss out maybe some of what the pitfalls might be. You make your arguments. One hero makes an argument. And if they mention a pitfall, their interest and patience go down by one. They appeal to a motivation, their interest goes up by one. Patience remains the same. If they attempt to appeal to the same motivation again, no change in interest, but patience goes down. If they mention neither a pitfall nor motivation, then they make the target number roll with a charm or a persuasion. And if they succeed, the interest increases by one. If they fail, the interest goes down by one. It can go down by more if they're caught in a lie. Whether they succeed or fail, the patience goes down by one. So they only have a few chances to do this if they're not getting on the motivations. When interest is five or zero or patience goes to zero, the negotiation's over. And oh, and after every argument the heroes make, the NPC can respond, kind of give the, the heroes the idea of what's happening. You can show all these numbers to the party so they can see them game wise. And that might, you know, elevate the drama. Or you can keep it secret if that's what you prefer. Now, in the, oh, and also, there's no, um, nothing preventing the NPC from trying to deceive the party and uh, say yes, but it's really a lie. In the end, if the interest gets to five, negotiation over, party got the best result. Four, three, two, and one, it can end if the patient's at zero or the party doesn't keep pushing and the party gets, you know, a result of yes or yes, but, or no, but, or no. And then the interest drops to zero, negotiations are over, party gets nothing, and the NPC is actively hostile. Then the party can, like I said, keep going as long as the patient's not at zero. So that is the negotiation. Finally, the last rule we have here is for creature info, just some general creature roles, uh, talking about basic attack and stat blocks. So creatures might have a basic attack that has an effect listed, but when it's being done as a basic attack, no effect is used. Just a caution there if you're trying to run these creatures. And then how minions work. I'm, I'm new to MCDM minions, so this is interesting. You know, you make an attack, you're going to kill a minion. You might kill more than one if you get multiples of the minion's damage threshold. They have to be adjacent within your reach or adjacent to what you're attacking. And then inversely, if an area effect affects a bunch of minions, you might not kill them all. You'll kill one at least, and then multiples depending on damage threshold again. I like that. That's a pretty interesting way to do it. They act in groups, five at a time. They can make group attacks. Their boons and banes might individually be factored in. And they might have special powers depending on how many minions they have. And that is it. That is the MCDM Playtest Packet 1 rules. We're going to be doing a playtest of this in the next week or two. Can't wait. Uh, I'm going to get together with DM David, do a live show on Tuesday where we're going to look at the pre-gen characters and kind of look at what they have and how they interact with these rules. So uh, jump on board then. Watch us do that. That's going to be on Tuesday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. If you have any questions, put them in the chat here or put them in the comments below here and come to the chat, leave them there. Um, if you've played it all, let me know how it went for you. And we will see you hopefully in that live chat or hopefully for the playtest game after we've done the playtest. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys next time.